from war and violence to the civil rights movement to hip-hop, from Hurricane Katrina to race politics, Professor Michael Eric Dyson takes it all on. Over the past 14 years, he's written 14 best-selling books, including Come Hell or High Water and Debating Race. Ebony Magazine has named him as one of 100 most influential African Americans. His latest book, just out now, is called Know What I Mean? Reflections on Hip-Hop. Professor Dyson is an ordained Baptist minister, was just named university professor at Georgetown, where he teaches English, theology, and African American studies. Michael Eric Dyson joins us now in our firehouse studio with the rain pouring down outside. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you so much. It's always great to be here. With it's you. great to have you with us. Mm -hmm. As we're listening to Tupac, we heard that N-word last week um, in Detroit, I think it was. Yes, it was. Um, you have the NAACP holding a funeral yeah. um, for the N-word, right. burying it. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, in, in Detroit is my hometown, so I'm from Detroit. and. Uh, I appreciate the historic legacy of the NAACP. Some people think, well, can you get rid of the colored in the NAACP first before you jump on the N-word? I think uh, maybe I'm an ordained Baptist preacher. Maybe like Jesus, if you bury the N-word, it will rise again on the third day. Uh, I think the Holy Ghost of rhetorical fire will insist that the N-word not be buried. I don't think you can bury words. I think the more you try to dismiss them, the more power you give to them, the more circulation they have. I think that there are many more issues that the NAACP should be focused on, structural inequality, social injustice, this war in Iraq, the imperial presidency, which has subverted the democracy of the country. Well, let me get your response to what Julian Bond said, the, the chair of the uh, board okay. of the NAACP. Hymas controversy gave all of us a heightened awareness of how harmful the spoken word can be. And while we are great respecters of the First Amendment, had there not been a First Amendment, this organization would not exist. But we don't believe it's a violation of the First Amendment to say to somebody, you ought not talk that way. You ought not denigrate women. You ought not condemn people because of the color of their skin. So this, we hope, is sending a message to the world, the country, particularly the world, that there are certain words that ought not be spoken. And the N-word is one of them. That's Julian Bond, Michael Eric Dyson. I, resp I respect Julian Bond, and I think that uh, non-black people should respect that rule. But I think when you have African-American people who are employing that term, Martin Luther King Jr., the night he was murdered, before that, when Andrew Young came in after being missing in action all day, King said, little in, where have you been? The point is that Martin Luther King Jr. was undeniably in uh, defense of African-American people, but there are ways in which nuances, in which complex uses of that term that don't signify hate and vitriol. And I don't think Don Imus can blame hip-hop for his problems. First of all, the demonization of black women is much older than Snoop Dogg. Uh, this is a history in America that is racist, that sees black women as uh, oversexed because they had to deal with the oversexed organs of their black men. But there's no question that hip-hop must bear responsibility. I'm not denying that. I think that the, the vitriol directed against women has to be taken on head on. But the NAACP, uh, Rainbow Push, National Action Network, let's look at their sexual politics. Let's look at the history of the civil rights movement and its own tortured gender politics. No, you're not using the B word or the H word, but if you go to a black church, 75 to 80 percent of the women who are there are giving their tithes, supporting a patriarchal order where they can cook, clean, and sew, but cannot pastor a church they numerically dominate. I'll tell you, that's misogyny at its worst. You have a chapter or a track, as you put it in your mm. book, cover your eyes as I describe a scene so violent. Right, right. Dealing with the uh, reality of violence and homophobia uh, and the assault upon women and the kind of vicious attack, black-on-black so-called crime uh, in black America that's being glorified and glamorized. So again, I, I sympathize and empathize with Mr. Bond in re regard to saying, look, we've got to do something about it. I just don't think uh, the attempt to restrict the use of the word itself among African-American people, to not make a distinction between Don Imus and Snoop Dogg is rather ludicrous. I think that there are some, there's a great deal of resentment uh, in some white pockets and communities, why can't we use that word? Well, first of all, you invented the term, right? That's not a black term. So it's not like white folk didn't have their chance, right? They invented the term, and then when black people took it over, you know what? I'm not going to allow you to define me that way. I'm going to take a term you use as hateful and use it as a term of endearment in part. I know it's more complex than that. Then now the people who invented it go, well, Dad, Gimmer, how come we can't use it? Because we took the term from you. We being collective, and I'm not, I know I'm being over large here. My point is simply this. Words have histories. They do track into material effects, but they 
also have the ability to allow us to resist them. If women use the B word among themselves, that's different than a man using it. If gay and lesbian people use queer among themselves, that's different than us using it on the outside. So I think there are inside and outside discourses. And it does get messy in a global economy where now a CD can be put out in Africa somewhere or even in Japan. People who don't speak English can say the N-word among themselves, not understanding that history. I get that. But Snoop Dogg is not W.B. Du Bois. And white kids cannot be educated by rappers. We have other intellectuals that you don't teach them to listen to who could inform them about that. Do you think, I should have been thrown off the air, actually now word is he's coming back? Yeah, he's coming back. You know, uh, look, I think at the point, at that time, Imus was uh, an unfortunate or fortunate scapegoat and an example at the same time. Welcome to the black world, brother. <laughs> so that's the world we live in. Uh, he's a rich, rich guy. He ain't gonna hurt for a while. I think he was part of a flashpoint along a bigger trajectory of contest over what can be said and not said. It's not simply about political incorrectness because Imus was jumping on vulnerable populations along with, you know, very powerful people. So I think the fact that he got away with that for so long and people who were on local network television and national network television were getting a free pass. They knew Imus was making racist jokes they knew he was saying some horrible things in his sidekicks, but not until, ironically enough, he assaulted these poor black women. And, and guess what? Most of them had straightened hair, so they weren't even nappy-headed. The, the reality is his bias obscured his ophthalmological perception. His optic nerve somehow got contorted because these women had straight hair. They were only a couple, quote, nappy-headed women. So he was signifying something deeper. Dark-skinned women are not seen as beautiful. Lighter-skinned women are seen as beautiful. That's what he tapped into. I saw no conversation hardly on television about that because these are deep internal debates in black America. So yeah, I think at that point he should have been kicked off, but I'm glad to have him back. I'll see. Let's just see if he's changed as he said he is. Let's just see if he's actually been informed the way he said he was. We're talking to Michael Eric Dyson, a professor now at Georgetown. Well, yes. this is new. It is. It just happened July 1. Uh, you know, went to uh, G-Town to become a Hoya. I just have to say, if people hear the noise in the background, it's not a truck going by. Uh, it is rain that is falling hard on a hundred-year-old firehouse where we broadcast from in New York. I mean, it is storming outside. It is storming outside, and that's a metaphor for what's going on in this country now, the hailing down of uh, resistance and rebellion against an imperial presidency, the vicious fascism of a Dick Cheney and a Condoleezza Rice. I tell you, let it rain and cleanse us. <laughs> well, talking about war. Mm -hmm. uh, the Senate had one of these rare overnights yeah, uh, right. where the senators got together, had pizza, had their cots outside, and right. they talked about the war, about possibly pulling troops out by next April, a vote right. that they say will not pass today. Yeah. Um, what about the war in Iraq? Well, it's, it's horrible. I mean, the fact is that we have to make a dramatic show, a theatrical show of solidarity with the masses of people. I mean, you look at a, a, a woman like Cindy Sheehan who's saying, look, I want to hold you Democrats as equally responsible as these Republicans, and now people are pushing back on her. The reality is that we have to hold all of us accountable and our political representatives, the neoliberal politics that have ceded the legitimacy of the war initially, now seeing that the tide of the country has turned back against them. I think the Senate has to be responsible, and I think we as an American people have to speak out against this war, which is costing us, you know, billions of dollars a month uh, in, in a day. We could be helping not only so many people here, we could actually be rebuilding the infrastructure that we've devastated. And we know hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in this vicious war on the other side, but we never hear any reporting about that. I think it's time for us as an American people to stand up and rise up and say enough is enough. 